Hey everybody, welcome back to Reason and Theology, your host Michael on a Wednesday, joined by Jimmy Aiken. We're talking about theistic evolution. Can a Catholic be a theistic evolutionist? We're also going to touch on questions like old earth versus young earth, and then polygenism versus monogenism. And don't worry, we will define these terms. But again, here to join me in this discussion is Jimmy Aiken. Jimmy, great to have you back. How are you? Hey, Michael, it's great to be here, and I'm doing wonderful. Hope you're doing wonderful, too. Doing good, and I, I have to say, as I as I pretty much do every time that you come on the show, I really appreciate your Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World show, so thank you so much for doing those. Keep them coming. Oh, thank you. People can check that out by going to mysterious.fm or to my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. Can you give us a sneak peek on what's coming up? Well, this Friday, we are uh, doing uh, the second part of a two-part look at conspiracies involving the deputy Fuhrer, Rudolf Hess, mm -hmm. from World War II. So he, in 1941, made a dramatic flight to England. He um, claimed to have a secret peace plan that could have avoided World War II as it unfolded, that would have made peace between Britain and Germany. And when he got there, the British arrested him and he spent the rest of his life in prison. But there are all kinds of questions like, why did he go? Uh, was he tricked into coming? Did he have Hitler's authorization? Um, did the British trick him into, into, into arriving there? What was his peace plan? Was it really him? Mm. who was in prison or was it an, an imposter and finally was he did he commit suicide or was he murdered and by whom awesome looking forward to that i think you already did part one right yes yeah yeah so that's already there for people to watch and then they could be caught up for this friday's episode nice looking forward to it so let's dive into the topic at hand just with some preliminary questions. Let me ask you, what is really at stake in these discussions of young earth, old earth, theistic evolution versus creationism, polygenism, monogenism? What's really at stake? Is, is it really an important debate and discussion? Well, it's important in the sense that the Christian faith does have things to say about origins, and the question is, uh, does modern do modern scientific findings give us reason to question or reject? what the Christian faith has to say, or are they compatible? And, um, or is modern science just completely wrong? Well, um, if, if modern science is completely wrong, that's obviously a serious concern. If modern science is not completely wrong, and it contradicts what the faith has to say about these issues, then that's obviously bad for the faith. Um, and so the, uh, uh, an important question in this area is, are the two compatible? Do they actually contradict or can they be read in ways that are, uh, that are harmonious? And fortunately, the magisterium has already weighed in on that question and said, yeah, they, they can be read in ways that are harmonious. Now, one of the things that often happens in situations like this is you have a pretty polarized environment. You have some people who are very strong supporters of evolutionary theory who look down on Christians and diss Christians as a bunch of benighted ignoramuses. Mm. Um, and then you also have some people who are very strong supporters of young earth creationism who look down on everyone who uh, believes in evolution as a benighted ignoramus. And so you have a lot of hostility coming from both sides. Um, I personally in my, make it my mission to just explain what the church teaches. And the church doesn't have teachings on matters of science. What it will do is it will um, talk about, and what is legitimately within its scope of teaching, is do the sources of faith contradict science? 
and and it can make rule it makes rulings on that and it's made the ruling that sub, in in substance they don't here you can believe in both an old earth and you can believe in evolution including human evolution and still be a good catholic and still be a good christian you're not contradicting the faith by doing those things however that doesn't mean that uh young earth creationism is false because it could be science is just wrong on all these things. And so I always make a point of saying that you can be a good a good Christian and a good Catholic regardless of whether you believe in evolution and an old earth the way the magisterium is, it says you can, but you can also be a good Christian and a good Catholic if you believe in young earth creationism. So I defend the rights of young earth creationists. Unfortunately, some of them don't like that I'm not just only endorsing their side. And so I sometimes get uh, criticism from young earth creationists, uh, Jimmy Aiken is an ignorant fool and things like that. But I'm just saying what the magisterium is saying. So mm. I can understand people may not want to say, I disagree with the magisterium, but don't use me as a surrogate for your anger. Fair enough. And why do you think tensions are so high when it comes to the dis the discussion why do you think some people take that route of polemicism well i think it's because the i think it's i mean ultimately it's because of you know original sin we all have a hostile streak in us and some things bring it out and this brings it out in some people on both sides like i said you have some very snarky arrogant atheists who who diss Christians, and you have some very snarky, arrogant young earthers who diss evolutionists. So, um, you know, that's just the reality. Fortunately, there are lots of people who are not so snarky. There are lots of people who believe in old earth and evolution who are very moderate. There are lots of people who believe in young earth creationism who are very moderate. So, it, you know, the squeaky wheel tends to get the grease. And so the loudest, shrillest voices tend to get a lot of attention in the public sphere. But but many people, regardless of their position, are actually quite moderate and, and not polarized. Do you think that some of the polemicism and emotional reaction comes from the fact that some people think that the credibility of divine revelation is at mm -hmm. stake in the discussion? Yes. Um, on the young earth side, uh, you have people who disagree with the magisterium that the two can be read compatibly. And so naturally they have a concern mm -hmm. that the credibility of Christian revelation is at stake. Same thing on the other side. You have people on the evolutionary side who, once again, disagree with the magisterium in saying they're compatible, and they and they want to use it. They want to they want to use the uh, uh, their disagreement with the magisterium as a weapon for attacking the Christian faith and saying this is just these harmonizations don't make any sense and science disproves the traditional view, therefore Christianity is false. So in both cases, whether they're coming from the young earth side or the older side, if they disagree with the magisterium, they're, they're focused in on the credibility of divine revelation. Hmm. Now, in this discussion, do you think that most Christians are properly formed to make informed judgments on this discussion, whether it comes from the perspective of sacred revelation or from the perspective of weighing in on science? Most Christians are experts in the things that they use most often in their lives, uh, like their particular jobs, you know, that they earn a living at. Um, but they tend not to be experts on things that they don't use all the time. And so most Christians are not, are not professional scientists or even serious students of science. Uh, and so they tend to go along with whatever they've heard. If they're in a crowd that is very young earth, they'll tend to go along with young earth. If they're in a crowd that is pro-evolution, they'll tend to go along with a pro-evolution stance. And most Christians don't really look at a lot of the scientific evidence. They may look at occasional scientific arguments, but it's not really their field. It's not, it's not their interest. And so they tend to go along with the consensus that they're aware of in their own community. Similarly, um, 
most uh, most uh, Christians and most Catholics are not experts in magisterial teachings and the history of how they've developed over time. And so they may have heard a few things about the magisterium uh, and what it said on these subjects, but they typically haven't done a thorough study of the history of magisterial thought on these questions. And so they, once again, tend to just go along with whatever the summary is that is common in their own community, whether it's pro or anti-evolution. And that's really how we all operate in any area that we're not experts in, and we can't all be experts in everything. We tend to just go along with the view that we hear in our own community um, from people we trust. Yeah. Now, if sacred scripture and the magisterium does it definitively or even just authoritatively weigh in on these discussions and one does not have an expertise in science, would it be best for them to just remain sort of agnostic about this issue or should they take a firm position? Well, I think that in I think that Catholics should take a firm position in favor of the magisterium and its stance, saying that these views are compatible. Mm-hmm. And beyond that, um, in terms of evaluating the views scientifically, you know, if one thinks the evidence really strongly favors one side or another, and you've researched the evidence, then it's certainly you know you can certainly. F- arrive at a very firm conclusion. But most people not being experts have have to defer to somebody. Mm -hmm. And in matters of science, it's generally better, not always better, but generally better to defer to the mainstream scientific position, not as a matter of faith, not as something to get worked up about and, you know, start looking down on other people. But you know, it, it just like if if someone said, you know, I don't know how electricity works, mm-hmm. um, but uh, but I'm going to take a position radically opposed to what all the physicists say. That would be a pretty risky move to make if you're not an expert in physics, you know, which deals with electromagnetism. On the other hand, if you're not an expert and you're aware of, you know, all the electrical devices in our world, you might say, well, um, I don't know how electricity works really, but I understand that, you know, scientists say it's based on the flow of particles called electrons, and I'm going to defer to that because, they're the people who are the experts, and that's the safest thing for me to defer to if I'm not going to take the time to study it for myself. Now, tell me about theistic evolution. What exactly is it? How does it compare to maybe a secular perspective on evolution? And then also, how does it compare to, um, for lack of a better term, just creationism? So th- it's going to depend on the how you define terms. There are a bunch of different ways in which you can define creationism. There are a bunch of different ways in which you can define theistic evolution. But just to keep things simple, I would say that um, theistic evolution would be the view that God used, so this is the theistic part, God used a series of intermediate biological forms to produce the creatures that we see here on earth today. So the plants, the animals, human beings, they had ancestors that weren't identical to them and that ultimately um, go back to simpler organisms that lived millions or even billions of years ago. And God was in control of that process. He used it for his purposes. And there are variations on, like, did God intervene at various points? Exactly how did he use it? Is there an exception for man? Did he do something unusual in our case? But as long as you're saying that something like the process of biological evolution happened and that God was in control of it, he was using it, then that would be theistic evolution. Creationism would then be a denial of that. It would be saying that God didn't use intermediate biological forms to produce the creatures that live on earth today. Instead, he created them in one, in one step, essentially. He, he, in the case of man, he you know, took dirt from the ground and made the body of the first man and then animated it, and he either did something similar for, you know, lions and pine trees or, 
or you know maybe he made pine tree sculptures and lion sculptures and then animated them or he did something else he could have just snapped his fingers and created them out of nothing but the point is there's no um series of biological precedents leading up to them they mm -hmm. were created in their current form directly by god and only within a few thousand years ago typically okay now do you have any magisterial arguments in support of theistic evolution. It seems like you've indicated several times today already that uh, the magisterium at least indicates that theistic evolution is compatible with, and science is compatible with, divine revelation on this subject. So can you maybe talk to us about the magisterium on this? Yeah, um, so there have, it, I guess a good starting point, there are precedents, but a good starting point is the pontificate of Pius XII. Mm -hmm. Now, thus far in terms of in terms of evolution, we've been discussing biological evolution, which pertains to the creatures that we see here on Earth. But there's another kind of evolution that scientists also talk about, which is cosmological evolution, where you have, according to the standard account, the Big Bang occurring about 13.8 billion years ago, and then stars and galaxies formed from that, and planets formed, and that whole process is known sometimes as cosmological evolution. And then here on Earth, where we have life, you also have biological evolution happening. In terms of cosmological evolution, Pius XII was a big supporter of it. Um, he gave in 1950 a couple of lectures in which he talked about it, and he was a huge fan of Big Bang cosmology. He was, he, he was really impressed by the work of Father George Lemaitre, the Belgian priest who uh, and cosmologist who came up with the idea of the Big Bang. And in his talks, Pius XII cites various scientific evidences for an old Earth. Uh, he cites um, findings from astronomy, things like the age of, uh, of different star systems, um, the age of meteorites, that have fallen to Earth, the age of the Earth's crust, and he notes that these um, are much older than a few thousand years. He, in his talks, uh, speaks of the Earth being five billion years old, mm -hmm. just the Earth, and the cosmos as being even older. Mm -hmm. And so he was a big fan of an old Earth. Mm -hmm. um, now, that is not a teaching that the earth is old because he's appealing to matters of science so this is not a matter of doctrine but it is an indication that the magisterium doesn't view cosmological evolution as something that's incompatible with the christian faith he also in 1950 released an encyclical called humane generis and in humane generis he discusses a number of matters, and one of them is human evolution. And something a lot of people don't realize is he's only talking about human evolution mm -hmm. in Humane Generis. He is not discussing the evolution of other life forms at all. And okay. so he doesn't have a problem with the idea of biological evolution for other life forms, for lions and pine trees. Instead, what he says about human evolution is that Catholics can, you know, cautiously engage, entertain the hypothesis under certain restrictions, which we'll talk about. Um, but he, he says as long as these certain restrictions are maintained, it's possible for Catholics to entertain human biological evolution. And he has no problem, as I said, with other forms of biological evolution. It's just human evolution he's talking about. Subsequent to Pius XII, the Magisterium has had further things to say, and in 1996, for example, John Paul II gave a speech to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in which he noted the progress in the 46 years that had passed since Humanae Generis had come out, the scientific progress, and he said that scientifically we now have multiple lines of evidence that are not forged, that are not coerced, that were not cooked, um, that would support 
human biological evolution. And he then refers back to Pius XII and says, and my predecessor Pius XII already said there's no incompatibility here as long as you maintain certain restrictions. Yeah, let, let's let's look at that with Pius the Twelfth. I'm going to pull it up on the screen because I, I want to get your comment because this is what everybody always brings up, of course, from Humani Generis. Um, so this is section 37. It says, when, however, there is question of another conjectural opinion, namely polygenism, the children of the church by no means enjoy such liberty. For the faithful cannot embrace that opinion which maintains that either after Adam there existed on this earth true men who did not take their origin through natural generation from him as from the first parent of all, or that Adam represents a certain number of first parents. Now that it is now it is in no way apparent how such an opinion can be reconciled with that which the sources of revealed truth and the documents of the teaching authority of the church proposed with regard to original sin, which proceeds from a sin actually committed by an individual Adam in which through generation generation is passed to, on to all and is and is in everyone as his own. So yeah, can can you interact with that section because again that's what people are going to appeal to. I can, but actually that's that's not the only thing that Pius the 12th said sure. in terms sure. of restrictions. Sure. Um for example, he also if you back up a little bit. Uh -huh. Um in his where he introduces this question, he one of the things that he mentions is that uh, he says the Catholic faith. Well, let's read the previous paragraph. Sure. For, for these reasons, the teaching authority, and in Latin that's magisterium. Mm -hmm. For these reasons, the magisterium of the Church does not forbid that, in conformity with the present state of human sciences and sacred theology, research and discussion on the part of men experienced in both fields take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution in as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body, so this is human evolution, not mm -hmm. other kinds, as coming from pre-existent living matter. For, here's the first restriction, mm -hmm. for the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God. However, this must be done in such a way that the reasons for both opinions, that is, those favorable and those unfavorable to evolution, be weighed and judged with necessary seriousness, moderation and measure, and provided that all are prepared to submit to the judgment of the Church, to whom Christ has given the mission of interpreting authentically the sacred scriptures and defending the dogmas of faith. However, some rashly transgress this liberty of discussion when they act as if the origin of the human body from pre-existing and living matter were already completely certain and proved by the facts which have been discovered up to now and by reasoning on those facts and as if there were nothing in the sources of revelation which demands the greatest moderation and caution on this question. So he essentially, in, in section 36, he sets up two uh, qualifiers. The first one is we've got to say that the human soul is immediately created by God, so it's not inherited in an evolutionary process, mm -hmm. and also that um, the 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 formation of the human body is not yet been proved, mm -hmm. and that there are things in divine revelation that bear on this question. And then he goes into the subject of, some people pronounce it polygenism or polygenism, mm -hmm. um, and he sets up a restriction there. Now, one of the things that is that needs to be noted when you read John Paul II is he revisits these mm -hmm. topics, mm -hmm. and he says, okay, now, 46 years later, in light of the scientific evidence that has emerged since Humanae Generis, we now have very good scientific evidence mm -hmm. that the human body was created through biological evolution. So he modifies that point. He also restresses the other points that Pius XII named, like the human soul is created directly by God, mm -hmm. but he does not mention Pius XII's restriction on polygenism. And this is probably a good time to explain what polygenism is mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. it's what the alternative is. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea that Adam and Eve were an original human couple that was the only couple of humans that existed is known as monogenism. Um, monos means soul, and so they were the sole human couple, the only human couple. On the other hand, there is an alternative view that there were many 
human couples. Many is polus, and so the idea there were many original human couples is known as polygenism. And, um, and Pius XII is issuing a caution against polygenism or polygenism. Um, the specific language he uses, though, isn't to say it's false. If you, it, we always have to be very careful in analyzing the language that the magisterium uses in its documents. And the language he uses is regulatory mm -hmm. rather than doctrinal. Because what he says is that Catholics don't have the liberty right. to entertain polygenism. And he doesn't say polygenism is false. He says we don't have the liberty to, uh, to freely discuss it. And so that's regulatory language. Mm -hmm. And then he gives a reason for the regulation, which is that it's not obvious mm -hmm. how to square this with the doctrine of original sin. Because the traditional understanding of original sin is Adam and Eve were one couple, they fell into sin, and we all inherited original sin from them. Mm -hmm. And so he says, because it's not obvious how to square this with original sin, we don't have the liberty to entertain this the way we do other aspects of biological evolution. Well, the, what that did, what the effect of that was, was it focused theological attention on can these two things be reconciled? Can you reconcile polygenism with original sin? And so bunches of theologians started working on that question, they started writing on it, and they started proposing ways that you could reconcile multiple original human couples with the idea of original sin. They, in fact, produced different models for how to do that. And by the 1960s, the mid-1960s, the Vatican's own newspaper, mm -hmm. L'Osservatore Romano, was publishing an article saying, here are several different ways you could reconcile original sin with polygenism. And this was back in the day when getting published in L'Osservatore Romano actually meant something. I mean, today they do reviews of The Simpsons, but back then in the mid 1960s, you know, this was a, this was a definite sign that your views are compatible with an Orthodox Catholic understanding if they're getting published in the Vatican's own newspaper. And so, for them to be printing stuff like that in the mid 1960s indicates there had already been a shift. You then look, and that shift continues. I've done a careful study of the history of this, but you find uh, Paul VI issuing cautions uh, about polygenism, just saying you shouldn't proceed as if it's been proved. He, he's, he's not forbidding discussion of it the way Pius XII did, but he's saying you shouldn't be proceeding as if it's already been proved, because in his view it hasn't. Um, early in the reign of John Paul II, you find similar statements from him where he's, he's you know, quoting Paul VI and saying, look, guys, he's not saying don't discuss it, but he's just saying don't assume it. Don't mm -hmm. assume it's been proved. And then later in John Paul II's reign, by 1996, when he gave his famous speech to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, he drops it. He goes silent on the question of polygenism. So we see this shift happening on the papal level from how Pius XII forbade Catholics from discussing it as a regulation to Paul VI and early John Paul II allowing discussion but saying, be very cautious, don't assume this, to the later John Paul II just dropping the subject. At the same time, we see um, a parallel develop set of developments on the, on the scale of the National Conference of Bishops and the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. In the 1960s, the uh, Dutch Episcopal Conference issued a very controversial catechism that's today known as the Dutch Catechism, mm -hmm. and it discussed uh, original sin and other issues in ways that were problematic. And so Paul VI appointed a commission of cardinals to review the Dutch Catechism and point out deficiencies, and these were then published as an appendix. Well, when they published the appendix, um, and so this was approved, I mean, it was reviewed by the Vatican, it's being prepared by cardinals, this is the Vatican's correction to the Dutch Catechism, it's open to polygenism. 
it 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 corrects some of the things the Dutch bishop said, but it 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 in the revision, it is open to polygenism. You then in the 1980s had the German Conference of Bishops. Now I should mention after the release of the Dutch Catechism, because that was such a problem for the church, a rule got implemented that national catechisms, if they're being issued in the name of a conference of bishops, they have to be reviewed first before they can be published by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Because national catechisms are big prestigious things, they're going to influence a lot of people, and after the debacle of the Dutch catechism, the CDF now gets to review them and sign off on them before you print them. And so in the 1980s, the German bishops produced a catechism um, for adults, and it was reviewed by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith under the stewardship of Joseph Ratzinger, who was a native speaker of the language of the catechism and who was the head of the CDF at the time. And they gave their approval and let the German bishops publish it. And it also is open to polygenism. In fact, it's it's printed by Ignatius Press. It's called a Catholic adult catechism. I assume people can get at least used copies. They may even still have it in print. But in its section on evolution, it says that not only is evolution not incompatible with the Catholic faith, but that polygenism can be understood in ways that are that are consistent with Catholic teaching on original sin. Then in 2002, the International Theological Commission, which is a body that's run, it's an advisory body, but it's run by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, it published a document called Communion and Stewardship, which dealt, among other things, with the image of God in man. And it, in discussing the, 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 the issue of human origins, is also explicitly open to polygenism. In one passage, it talks about how Adam could be understood either as an individual or as a symbol of the early human community. And in another passage, it talks about how the human population um, emerged according to the standard account, you know, several tens of thousands of years ago in Africa. And you could understand the emergence of humanity either in terms of individuals or populations. And so you have the International Theological Commission under the auspices of the CDF, again, being open to polygenism and saying we can understand it in ways that are compatible with the Christian faith. And one of the things that the bylaws for the International Theological Commission states is that its documents have to, before they can be published, they have to be reviewed either by the Pope or the head of the CDF, and they can only be published on the provision that the magisterium does not have any difficulty with them. Hmm. And so that means that either Joseph Ratzinger or John Paul II reviewed communion and stewardship ahead of time and concluded that from a magisterial point of view, there was not any difficulty with what it said in terms of um, the question of, polyg of, of polygenism. Um, so we have, again, a, a significant shift on this question from where things were several decades before. Also, I would happen to mention that one of the later successors of John Paul II, uh, Cardinal Gerhard Müller, um, who was head of the CDF towards the end of Benedict's pontificate and the beginning of Francis's pontificate, um, he's, he is uh, uh, an author. He's written a book of dogmatic theology in German. It's a big, huge book. Um, but if you read what he says when he talks about this uh, section of Humanae Generis and, and so forth, he indicates he, in his dogmatic theology that this is not incompatible with the Christian faith. It can, polygenism can be understood in a way that's compatible. It's not a matter of dogma that we have to reject polygenism. And there's the head of the CDF saying this in one of his own books, and he then got appointed head of the CDF. Hmm. Now, there are going to be some people who say that, you know, the church fathers are unanimous in uh, their position against evolution, or perhaps against polygenism. Um, 
What would you say to people who try to present that case? Well, so unanimity is not, there are two sort of relevant issues. The first one is the church fathers are not themselves the magisterium. Many members of the church fathers were members of the magisterium. You, in order to be a member of the magisterium, you have to be a bishop. Mm -hmm. And so fathers like St. Augustine, St. Leo the Great, St. Gregory the Great, all of those guys were bishops, and two of them were popes, so they were definitely members of the magisterium. But that's not true of all fathers. Mm -hmm. St. Ephraim the Syrian was a deacon, and St. Jerome was only a priest. So not all church fathers are members of the magisterium. The second thing that needs to be discussed is unanimity among members of the magisterium, because it is not sufficient for, and people often get this wrong, you all you very frequently hear statements like, if something's always been taught, then it's guaranteed to be true, or if, the, then it's infallible, mm -hmm. or if, um, if, if there's unanimity among the church fathers or among members of the magisterium, then it's guaranteed to be true. It's infallible. And neither of those is church teaching. What the church teaches is that in the case of the ordinary and universal magisterium, the bishops must agree with moral unanimity. It doesn't have to be absolute unanimity, but with moral unanimity, they have to agree not just that something is true, but that it must be held definitively by the faithful, meaning there can be no further future discussion of this. Um, and so it's not sufficient. And if you apply that principle to the Church Fathers, which is a bit problematic because they're not all members of the Magisterium, but certainly um, the same kinds of things are going to occur. It would not be sufficient for the Church Fathers to merely agree that something is true they would need to agree that it must be held definitively by all of the faithful. And I don't see them doing that. I see church fathers saying, this is what I think, and, and you know, Adam and Eve were two historical individuals, but there is discussion around the edges. I mean, Augustine talked about things that were in that were consistent with evolution. He wasn't simply... He didn't take as strong a creationist stance as a lot of people think. I mean, he was a creationist, but it's not. It's his model is more complex than what uh, a lot of creationist models are. And aspects of Augustine's model are developmental, and would lead you know are consistent with evolution in that sense. He also didn't take the days of Genesis literally. He thought that they are a way of presenting the work of the Creator, but that are not literal 24-hour days. Um, so you you have differences there that are with a prestigious father like Augustine. And when you get to the Middle Ages and you're reading Thomas Aquinas, he's saying, well, there's a difference of opinion. Some of the fathers say this, Augustine says that, and he doesn't really settle questions um, frequently in this area. So... What I don't see is either the Church Fathers or the Ordinary and Universal Magisterium having a definitive consensus, by which I mean one that holds not just that something's true, but that it must be held definitively by the faithful. To give an example of something that there would have been a moral unanimity on that that is not part of Church teaching, Ptolemaic cosmology. You know, the idea that the Earth is at the center of the universe, and there are these concentric crystal s spheres surrounding the Earth that the planets are attached to, and beyond them is a sphere to which all of the stars are attached. So the stars are, you know, a little bit beyond the orbit of Saturn. Well, okay, Ptolemaic cosmology was the standard view. And you would have, at the time, it was the standard scientific view until um, the beginning of the scientific revolution. And so it was the consensus view among early church fathers and among early members of the magisterium. If you said to them, so are the stars on a fixed shell that's out there? They would have said, yeah. And does, does when the Bible talks about the sun rising and racing its course over the heavens and setting in the west, is that literally the sun moving around the earth? Is that what scripture is saying? 
they would have said, yeah, because that's they were interpreting Scripture in light of the science of their day. But And you would have had moral unanimity on right. that, but what you didn't have was a unanimity that said, and the faithful must definitively hold this. There is no possibility of future discussion. And thus, when the scientific revolution began, and we got evidence that the stars are not on a fixed shell just beyond the orbit of Saturn, and the planets are not orbiting on crystalline spheres that surround the Earth, and that you can also run the math in a way that doesn't favor either the Earth or the Sun or any other point as the center of the universe— um, there was discussion on this, and the magisterium ultimately didn't have a problem with it. There was some, you know, there was kind of a transitional bump in the road with Galileo, but you had a recognition afterwards that the faith did not require the interpretations that there were previously a consensus on, because it was never a an infallible, definitive consensus. And I would say the same thing is true on this question. You do have a consensus of church fathers taking Adam and Eve as literal historical individuals. You have early magisterial members doing the same thing, but it was never a, a consensus that required the faithful to hold this definitively, which is what's necessary for infallibility to be triggered. Mere consensus is not enough. It must be a definitive consensus. So let, let's talk about that point, uh, a literal Adam and, Adam and Eve. Um, does Scripture necessitate that position in light of what it says about Jesus being the new Adam, and of course in light of what it says about original sin? So in other words, how can one make sense of those two things from a position that says, no, they're not necessarily literal? Well, so the the figure of Adam and Eve in Scripture are the progenitors of the original human race, and so they are the wellspring from which humanity flows. And Jesus and Mary are the progenitors of the new human race. The we're the new Christians are the new humanity. Uh, Jesus is the new Adam. Mary is the new Eve. All of the spiritual life flows from them. And so consequently, um, you can compare Jesus and Mary to Adam and Eve regardless of whether Adam and Eve were historical individuals, because Jesus and Mary do perform these functions for the new humanity, and thus you can describe them as new Adam and new Eve, the same way as if, um, you know, I don't believe Sherlock Holmes was a real individual, but if I met, like, the greatest detective ever, I could say, oh man, that guy is the new Sherlock Holmes. And people would know exactly what I meant, because he does perform a function that is like that of Sherlock Holmes. He displays detective talents that are like those of Sherlock Holmes. And in the same way, even if Adam is a symbol, you can, um, you can understand Jesus' function as providing life for the new humanity analogously to the way Adam provided life for biological humanity. I should say, though, the taking Adam and Eve as a symbol is not the only option here. In addition to Adam and Eve being symbols, and Adam and Eve being just the only two literal individuals that existed, there's also another position, which is that Adam and Eve were two historical individuals within a larger population. And so you can you can adopt that position as well. People have adopted that position. So we shouldn't think that the only alternative to Adam and Eve being two solo individuals is Adam and Eve are symbols. Um, there's also the idea that they were individuals just within a larger population. And as the heads or leaders of that population under corporate or federal headship, their actions affected the way the whole population went. So there are multiple possible positions here. No, but wouldn't that mean that there was already death in the world prior to Adam and Eve? Sure, that but, position? sure but that's not... Um, that's not... Uh, incompatible with the Christian faith. Uh, you have uh, Aquinas, for example, talking about how 
um, the nature of lions was not different before the fall. They were still obligate carnivores, just the way they are today. So what entered the world through Adam and Eve was human death, mm-hmm. not, not biological death. In fact, even if you take Genesis absolutely literally, um, you can show there was already biological death in the world prior to the fall, because Adam and Eve got to eat fruit. Right. And when you eat fruit, the fruit dies because your digestive system takes it apart and breaks it down into its components, and it's no longer a living piece of fruit. So there was already biological death in the world prior to the fall, even on a strictly literal reading of Genesis. And theologians like Aquinas would say that the same thing applied to animals. So you have space for dinosaurs to be killing each other and lions to be hunting gazelles before the fall and all kinds of stuff. It was the death of humans that is a consequence of the fall. And it, so you, and, and that wouldn't apply to their human ancestors because they weren't full theological, modern, biological humans. So yeah, their ancestors could have died leading up to the development of the biological form, which Pius Twelfth said we we can entertain and John Paul II endorsed so um, so the idea that pre-human ancestors died is not an issue what you might then entertain is the idea that at at human at humanity's inception the beginning of true modern proper humanity God either elevated Adam and Eve to a state where they would not have to die and then they lost it or he put them in a state where they had access to immortality by eating the tree of life, and then they lost access to immortality. But um, there's no problem with the idea, from the point of view of Christian faith, of the idea of pre-human ancestors having died, at least not in the view of pontiffs like um, Pius XII and John Paul II and other pontiffs. But these pre-human ancestors would not have had a human soul. Well, they would have had souls. Aquinas would agree to that. I mean, all the way back to Aristotle, the soul is the thing that makes your body alive. Mm -hmm. And so every living thing, whether it's plant, animal, fungus, whatever it is, it's got a soul. Um, So pre-human ancestors, let's say Homo erectus. Homo erectus would not have a Homo sapiens soul. It would have a Homo erectus soul. Mm-hmm. Um, and the boundary line between full modern humanity and what immediately preceded it might be a pretty small one, but um, you wouldn't have the emergence or the creation of the Homo sapiens soul until the emergence of Homo sapiens. Mm-hmm. Now, let's talk a little bit about young Earth, and then mm-hmm. we're going to talk about approaches to Genesis. Um, does sacred scripture, especially the book of Genesis, necessitate a young earth position, or are there ways to read it in which one could say otherwise? Well, so let's go back to Pius XII. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Pius XII said, and this is actually in, I believe, his next section, section 38 in Humanae Generis, is that um, the—and if it's not there, it's, it's elsewhere— but he discusses the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and he notes what a lot of scholars have noted, which is they're written differently than the rest of Genesis and the rest of the historical books of the Old Testament. There's just a literary difference there, and there are reasons for that literary difference, um, which are interesting. We may or may not want to go into them here, but it's a different kind of literature. And so one of the things that he says is that scholars need to study this kind of literature more, and he notes that in, uh, in his words, it's, it uses simple metaphorical language. I mean, he uses the word metaphor for Genesis, uh, for the first 11 chapters of Genesis, to communicate truths about God and man and the origins of the chosen people. And so he acknowledges that this, the, this first 11 chapters, the primordial history in Genesis, is written differently. It's a different kind of literature from what we find later in Genesis and in other historical books. And it uses, in his words, simple and metaphorical language. So there is a way to understand these, to understand the 
early accounts in Genesis as not requiring a young earth. And I think there are multiple reasons for that. I think there are even clues in the text that tell us we're not meant to take especially the data of Genesis 1 chronologically because the create the sequence of creation in Genesis of the six days of creation in Genesis 1 is very carefully structured um, you have an initial problem at the beginning of Genesis 1 where it says the earth was without form and void in Hebrew that's tohu wa bohu and then on the first three days of creation God solves the formlessness problem the tohu problem by forming the world by giving it structure so he separates day from night then he separates the waters above from the waters below and then he separates the waters below from each other so that dry land appears so now God has given has gone from top to bottom God has gone through the universe and given it form so it's no longer formless but it's still empty we still have the bohu problem and so on the second three days God goes back over the same three realms in the same order and populates them so they're no longer empty on day four corresponding to day one he goes back to the uh, the day and the night and he populates them with the Sun moon and stars on day five corresponding to day two he goes back to the waters above which the separation created the atmosphere so you have the sky and the sea and he goes back to the sky and the sea and he populates them with birds and fish and then on day six which corresponds to day three he goes back to the dry land and he populates it with the land animals and man so you see this very carefully structured account of how God created the world. And these two um, efforts have been recognized. This is not new. I mean, Thomas Aquinas talks about this. He refers to the first three days where God solves the formlessness problem as the works of distinction because God is distinguishing things. He distinguishes day from night, he distinguishes the waters above from the waters below, and he distinguishes the waters below from each other. He then refers to the second three days of creation as the works of adornment, because God goes back over the same three realms and adorns them with the sun, moon, and stars, with the birds and the fish, and with the land, animals, and man. So now the earth is not formless or void. God's work of creation is done, and on the seventh day, God kicks back. Now, what a careful reader in the ancient world would notice, and what some of them did notice, and they talked about this, is how is there a day and a night when the sun doesn't exist until day four? Because the ancients knew just as well as we do that it's the sun, it's the presence of the sun that lights up the sky and makes it daytime. You know, they recognize that. The sun gives heat to the things on the ground. It gives light to the things on the ground. The sun is the reason we don't see the stars in the daytime. They knew that. And they could even calculate where the stars that they had seen the previous night would be in the sky. I mean, that's actually, you know, that's where, this, that's where astro sun sign astrology comes from. Because you can see, oh, the sun is in Libra right now. You know, um, so they knew where the positions of the stars were, and it's the sun's light that blots them out. So an ancient reader would say, ha, huh, we've got this very clear literary structure here with the, the work of distinction and the work of adornment, and we've got the sun not being created till day four, and there have been three previous day-night cycles before the creation of the sun. Clearly, this is a literary account not a chronological account. And that's some of the reasoning that informed St. Augustine, because he talked about the sun on day four issue as one of the reasons why he thought these were an, that these were not a strict chronological account. Yeah, what, what about elements like forming man from dirt or Eve from a rib? Mm -hmm. Do you think that also kind of lends itself to what you're saying? Well, the way that, again, we're dealing with, in Pius XII's words, simple and metaphorical language that are meant to teach us truths about God, and John Paul II, in discussing both the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve, interpreted, interpreted the way they're depicted as symbols. Mm 
He interpreted the um, creation of Adam from the dust of the ground as a fundamental affirmation of, uh, of mankind's participation in the material order. So we're not like angels. We really are natives to the earth. We have bodies that come from the earth. Our bodies return to the earth. So this is teaching us a truth about man's role in creation. We are part of the material creation. And he then says that the creation of Eve from Adam's side is a, is a teaching the lesson of the fundamental humanity of women. They are not, uh, they're not a separate species. They're not, you know, inferior. They may have, you know, there may be a social hierarchy with respect to men, but fundamentally women are human beings. They're not an independent creation from mankind. Okay. Um, somebody brought this up before the 1909 mm -hmm. biblical commission, um, has some statements about the book of Genesis being in the historical genre. And some people will argue, well, that that then proves that you have to interpret this in a historical way, which they'll then infer that then means young earth creationism. So there are two problems with that. Uh, the first problem is, like Pius XII's statement on polygenism, um, the early pontifical biblical commission replies were regulatory in nature. And so they'll say things like Catholic exegete, you know, the question will be, do Catholic exegetes have the, the, the liberty to explore this idea? And they'll say no. And so a lot of them are, expli are explicitly phrased in terms of regulatory language. But furthermore, they've been superseded. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you read Cardinal Ratzinger's discussion of these early replies. I mean, I, I, there's a whole history to how they were superseded. You know, there mm -hmm. was a discussion, there was a, a famous letter to uh, Cardinal Seward of Paris in the 1940s where there was a query of, do we have to hold on to all those older things mm -hmm. like about the Pentateuch? And, this, and the CDF wrote and said, actually, in light of recent developments, there's no, there's no, um, restriction impeding further discussion of these questions and so they started reeling it back and by the night and that was in the 1940s mm -hmm. and uh by the 1990s you have cardinal ratzinger saying that um that they were a valuable warning for the time but they have since been superseded and they're no longer enforced that was reaffirmed during during benedict's pontificate by cardinal Oveda who then was the head of both of the CDF and the Pontifical Biblical Commission, which today is run by the CDF. So in both the case of Cardinal Ratzinger and Cardinal Aveda, you've got the head of the, of the PBC saying those old PBC decrees are no longer in force. And you and so, you would argue they're not necessarily doctrinal in nature anyway, but they rather were regulatory. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's a second problem. Mm -hmm. which is if you read the it this particular reply is from 1909 it was issued on June 30th and it contains um it contains seven questions uh, I'm sorry eight questions mm -hmm. and the eighth question is this whether in that designation and distinction of days so it's talking about Genesis 1 with which the account of the first chapter of Genesis deals the word ds or days can be assumed either in its proper sense of a natural day or in the improper sense of a certain space of time and whether with regard to such a question there can be free disagreement among exegetes so that's the question we'll let, i'll repeat it again just for clarity so what they're asking is whether in the six days of genesis 1 the word days Mm -hmm. can or day can be understood either as a natural 24-hour day or as a longer indefinite period of time and whether disagree exegetes can disagree with each other about that mm -hmm. the reply that the pbc gave you know, on june 30th 1909 was in the affirmative mm. so they said you can take the days of Genesis 1, either as 24-hour days or as long, indefinite periods of time. And different exegetes can freely disagree about that. So right there, mm -hmm. 
in 1909 itself, when the decree was in force, you had the PBC creating space for exegetes to hold an old earth views. Mm -hmm. So you can't appeal to the PV PBC and say, oh, it mandates a young earth. No, it doesn't. Not only are its decrees not in force anymore, but they were explicitly open to the idea of an old earth. Would it mandate, at least for a regulatory perspective, that they could not maintain polygenism, at least? They didn't address that question. Didn't address it at all. So they're, they're not creating a, regu a regulation on that point. The regulation mm -hmm. was created by Pius XII. Mm -hmm. uh, Sean Matthew asks a question here. I'm going to get to mm -hmm. it in just a second. Uh, I have one more for you before we get to those, but go ahead and put chat questions there in the chat. Make sure to put on to at Reason and Theology. What would you say to those who argue that Look, entertaining this kind of stuff, theistic evolution or old earth or polygenism, this is going to drive people away from the faith and from confidence in Scripture and from Christianity. Some of them it will, because people react differently to different things. It'll, the reverse will also happen. If you, if you insist on young earth creationism that will also drive people away from their christian faith because mm -hmm. they're going to they're going to go to college they're going to encounter scientific arguments they're going to encounter atheists who say genesis is is bunk nonsense and science has disproved it and they're going to have scientific evidence and arguments that they present to people and if you have taught them there is no room for compatibility here, they're going to lose their faith. And frankly, a lot more people have gone that way than the other way. A lot more people have abandoned their faith under that kind of pressure than, um, than uh, as a result of saying, hey, these are compatible. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Now, this is the one from Sean. Again, thank you for the soup chat. Would the genealogy in Luke 3, 38 show that Adam was a real historical person? Well, it might. Um, you know, the as I said, the idea that Adam is a symbol is not, um, is not something that is the only option here if you endorse polygenism. You could say, yeah, Adam was a real historical individual, and that's why Luke has him in his genealogy. On the other hand, we have to, as always, we have to be sensitive to genre questions, and ancient Near Eastern genealogies don't work the same way that ours do. Um, one of the things that they do differently than ours is they skip generations. Another thing that they do is they... Um, ignore the distinction between legal ties and biological ties. So you can, for example, be legally the son of someone, even though your biological father was someone else. Mm. Um, that, and we see that, like, this is because they were in a patriarchal society. If you want to be a member of our group, you have to be part of that patriarchal structure. So, like, if you want to become an Israelite, okay, which tribe are you going to be a member of? Mm -hmm. And and because you got to plug into this twelve tribe structure somehow. So we would be posthumously adopted, even though the patriarch, let's say Judah, you're going to join the tribe of Judah. Judah's long dead. Okay, but now you're legally a son of Judah, and you'll be ascribed to Judah's genealogy whenever we're doing genealogies. And um, we, in fact, see examples of that in Scripture. Caleb, the uh, one of the two good spies, the other one being Joshua. But at the time of the at the time of the um, of the coming into the promised land, Caleb was apparently he wasn't an Israelite. You know, we're told a mixed multitude of peoples left Egypt. He was apparently one of them. He was not an Israelite, but he went with them. He was a Kenizzite, according to various passages of Scripture. But then according to other passages of Scripture, he's a descendant of Judah. And so it looks like he was a Kenizzite who was originally not an, an Israelite. He was then he then joined the tribe of Judah and was legally ascribed to Judah's lineage. Another thing that um, has been documented anthropologically in Near Eastern genealogies is they will, when two groups merge, mm 
they need to because they need to relate to each other in terms of some kind of patriarch they will ascribe their common ancestry to somebody in the past th who was named the same thing as their group hmm. so if you have tribe a and tribe b and they come together and they merge into one group and they're going to be called the two sub clans of the warishi people then um so tribe a is sub clan one tribe b is sub clan two and now together they're the warishi people what they will do in their genealogy is they will say okay and we're descended from a guy named warishi and and anthropologists have documented this happening so we know this happened in um in happens in near, near eastern genealogies and that could be what adam is on the symbol view uh, because on the symbol view it's like okay well we're all humans we're all you know we're all man so we must be descended from some guy whose name is man and thus you end up with, um, on this view, with Adam as a symbol of the human community. So we're all descended from Adam, we're all descended from man, the way ancient Near Eastern genealogies could work. And so either on the historical individual idea or the symbol interpretation of Adam, it's within the bounds of the way ancient Near Eastern genealogies work. Both are options. And so therefore Luke's quotation of this genealogy is just repeating something. I mean, Luke didn't invent this genealogy. He got it from Jesus's family. And since ancient Near Eastern genealogies could include both literal historical individuals and eponymous ancestors who are invented to be the common bond among a group of people, both the symbol Adam view and the individual Adam view would be compatible. And both of those are compatible with polygenism because Adam could be a symbol on that view, or he could be an individual within a larger population. This one is from Swan Sona. He asks, would Jimmy say there are humans who didn't derive their soul from Adam through natural generation? How does he reconcile Catholicism with modern humans emerging 200,000 years ago? So could you keep that on the screen? Because yeah, I want to make sure. sure I answer it. Um, so would I say that there are humans who didn't derive their soul from Adam through natural generation? Well, the teaching of the magisterium is that the human soul is directly created by God. The alternative view that it's inherited is known as traducianism. And current Catholic teaching is that um, traducianism is false, that each individual soul is created by God, and therefore I would say all humans uh, are people who didn't derive their soul from Adam through natural generation. They all derived it directly from God, according to current church teaching. In terms of how do I reconcile Catholicism with modern humans emerging 200,000 years ago, um, I think that at least at the present stage of development, we don't have a good way to establish a mapping between the findings of paleontology and the Bible, because it, what the Bible is concerned with is modern man, and, it, and specifically with reference to God. So you could call what the Bible is concerned with theological man or biblical man or something like that. And it really doesn't enter into the question of what preceded or surrounded our ancestors. So um, it could be that only our subspecies, Homo sapiens sapiens, is biblical man. Or it could be that biblical the biblical vision of man is broader than that. You know, maybe it included Neanderthals or Homo floresiensis or um, Homo. Um, um, oh, um, it's the one in Russia. Starts with an N. I'm blanking on it. Anyway, mm. it could be that biblical man is just us, just modern Homo sapiens sapiens, or it could be something broader than that. And I don't think we have a way to settle that question at, at the moment because Scripture doesn't give us the data, and we know so little about these other groups that we don't have an effective way to compare them to to biblical man one of the things that i would strongly suspect is that any 
human relations that bury their dead, especially with grave goods, would have the concept of the afterlife and therefore would have an afterlife. I think if you have the concept of the afterlife, you've got one. And so if we could show, for example, Neanderthals, and there's some evidence suggesting this, but if we could show Neanderthals burying their dead with grave goods, so it's like I'm, I'm giving this to the dead person so that they can have it at least symbolically in the afterlife, um, then that would indicate they have a concept of an afterlife, and that could indicate that they're part of biblical man who does have an afterlife, or it could mean they're something a little different than biblical man. They're not biblical man, but they could still have an afterlife. This one um, is about the book of Romans. How do you reconcile Romans 5.12 by one man sin entered into the world with the possibility of polygenism? Well, there are multiple ways of doing that. One is to um, to take, and I'd have to look at the Greek here just to refresh my memory about exactly what does it say. Um, but one way is to say, okay, Adam was a literal historical individual. He was the federal head of the human race yeah. and in a larger population. I mean, he's already a member of a larger population because there's Eve. Mm -hmm. And if there were some additional people besides just Eve, that doesn't fundamentally change the dynamic. Adam's the federal head. He falls into sin. He takes humanity down with him. And so through one man, sin entered, sin entered the world. Um, it's also possible that uh, Paul is, you know, whether Paul's aware of it or not, I mean, he's using text from Genesis. And so you have to figure out what does Genesis mean on its own terms, um, not just what a later author assumes about it. This is something that's an important distinction um, from Vatican II. In De Verbum, it taught that what's guaranteed to be true is what the inspired author asserts. Mm. but not what the inspired author assumes. Right. And so the lesson that Paul is drawing out about Christ's role, which is the reason he's discussing Adam, he's making a comparison between Adam and Christ, um, the lesson he's teaching, which is about Christ, is true. Um, his assumption about the nature of the biblical text of Genesis is an independent question. And... Um, and so if you could establish that Adam is a symbol in the original text, Paul would simply be using this text. Um, but, and he might, he might or might not have been asserting certain things about it, but I can appeal to a text without thinking the text is literally true. You know, I can say, oh, Sherlock Holmes is a great detective, and I, I'm conveying a truth there, but that doesn't mean I literally believe that there was a Sherlock Holmes. So Paul could be taking that kind of attitude towards Genesis, where he's applying a lesson from Genesis without assuming Adam was a literal historical being, or it could be he's assuming Adam is a literal historical being, and that's an assumption that is not guaranteed to be true, since it's not an assertion but an assumption. Or it could be true he's asserting that Adam was a literal human being, in which case it's true that Adam was a literal human being. He just could have been part of a broader population. In fact, he was since Eve already existed. Do, do you think kind of to support what you're saying there about we hold to what the text asserts rather than what the author assumed, do you think an example of that is the psalmist talking about the sun rising? I mean, when we look yeah. at the text, obviously we can interpret that from a phenomenological perspective, but wouldn't the psalmist have assumed that this really was taking place? Yeah, he has a, he's a terrestrial earthbound perspective. He sees the sun arc over him. Of course he's going to assume that. Just like the ancients assumed that the sky was a metal a, a a firm structure. That's what firmament means. It, the Hebrew word refers to like a hammered surface, like a bowl. And so what they assumed, you know, the sky looks like a bowl that's sitting on top of us. So they assumed a flat earth with a bowl that God put on top of it because that's what it looks like. And they're assuming that, but that doesn't mean scripture is asserting that we must believe that that's the truth. We, it, scripture is asserting other things, and it's describing the environment we see in terms of a human perspective, but that doesn't mean there's no deeper account 
to be offered. Mm -hmm. Um, Here's one for you from Mm -hmm. Adam Baum. What is the magisterial weight of John Paul II's speech to the Pontifical Academy of Science? It's my understanding that the PAS has no authority delegated to it. No, but John Paul II does. He has authority delegated to him by Christ. And so Pope's speeches don't lose authority when they're talking to people who don't have authority. You know, I don't have authority. And if John Paul II, I'm just a layman. And if John Paul II taught, gave a speech to me in which he said something, if he's investing that speech with authority, it's got authority over me. So the, the fact that um, members of the PAS don't have authority, and in fact, some of them aren't even aren't even Catholic. I mean, Stephen Hawking was a member. Um, Elliot Gould, uh, not Elliot Gould. Um, oh, I always confuse him with Elliot Gould because he looks like him. Stephen Jay Gould, um, you know, was a member. It's an honorary scientific society, um, but that doesn't mean the Pope's words don't have authority. Kyle asks, "What would be some magisterial documents that address these topics? Any any offhand mm-hmm. that you could mention?" Well, the ones I've named, I mean, they what you don't have is a major magisterial document that ties it all together. We may get something, I think at some point we will get something like that. Mm-hmm. It Probably within the 21st century, maybe within my lifetime. Um, because the, after these themes percolate long enough, they're going to get revisited, they're going to get summarized, and based on the current trajectory, I would expect that within a few decades we'll have a magisterial document that basically confirms the major at least the majority of what we've said here in this discussion. That's one of the reasons I think it's important to have these discussions so that people don't get caught off guard mm. by that. Because if you have if if we didn't have discussions of so what does the magisterium really allow here? Mm-hmm. Then you would have people who are who are advocating a certain view whether they're creationist or atheistic evolutionists saying oh there's an incompatibility you have to take this particular view and then if you have the magisterium come out in 10 or 20 or 50 years and say actually you don't that would be very disorienting for people and could cause them a lot of cognitive dissonance so i think it's imp- it's important to have these discussions now to point out what the magisterium is saying so that people understand that and they're not caught off guard by future magisterial developments. Now here's a curveball for you. It's a question from Second Peter uh, 3, 6 about the flood to lend itself to a more liberal interpretation of Genesis. Mm-hmm. You know, Peter is talking about the flood and he says, and that by means of these, the world that was then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exists are stored up for fire being kept to ki- um, until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And the word for world there is cosmos. Mm-hmm. So what people are going to argue is that, okay, well, he's saying that the cosmos, the entire world, not just like a localized flood, the entire thing mm-hmm. flooded. So does does this not from Peter kind of lend itself to that literal interpretation of Genesis? Peter may well be assuming that. Um it's a separate question than human evolution or old earth. And Mm -hmm. I've discussed the great flood on um, Jimmy Akin's mysterious world. I did a, I actually did a three parter on young earth creationism and I did a two parter on the great flood. So people can look up those episodes to hear an extended discussion of what I'd have to say about them, including from the faith perspective Mm -hmm. and the scientific perspective, because I go through scientific evidence that pertains to these questions. Um, But you also find Um, Other passages, like when St. Paul says the gospel has been preached to the whole world, I'd have to check to see is he using cosmos there, but you do have this world language that gets used even though we're only talking about what was then the known world. Mm -hmm. You know, so when Paul says the gospel has been preached to the whole world, he means around the Mediterranean basin. You know, and and he doesn't mean to North America. And so you could look at Paul's statement and say, oh, there must not be a China and there must not be a North or South America because Paul says the gospel has been preached to the whole world and it hadn't been preached there. 
fight the machine, sheeple. Don't go along with the idea that China and North and South America exist. It's all a lie designed to pull you away from your Christian faith. <laughs> So, you know, um, if the world, if the word world can be used in more restrictive senses, then it can be used in more restrictive senses here. Um, the idea of a massive local flood, for example, could destroy what was then the known world. And, and the term cosmos also doesn't necessarily, as I know you know, Michael, a, a geographic significance, mm -hmm. but it can also be used to refer to a state of the order of things. Mm -hmm. And you can also say, yeah, in that sense too, the previous world, which was founded on wickedness, which is why God sent the flood, that got overturned. So that it doesn't exist anymore, although we're busily recreating it. Yeah, and, and he does use cosmos. Um, first, or I'm sorry, Colossians one mm -hmm. six. So yeah, he he is referring to Paul cosmos. Does. Yeah, Paul. Yeah. Whenever he speaks about the gospel being preached in the whole world. Um, here's a super chat for you. So Jimmy, would the burden of original sin suggest in polygenism that all the people in the first community took part in the first sin? That is one way of understanding it. It is possible that the early human community, and this is especially understandable on the symbol Adam model. If Adam's a symbol for the early human community and Adam sinned, that would mean the early human community, that could mean that the early human community as a whole felt turned away from God, fell into sin. It also could be the case though, if Adam's a historical individual, that he was the federal head Everything is, all the spiritual life in the early human community came from Adam, the way all of our spiritual life comes from Christ. Mm -hmm. And so if Adam fell into sin personally and lost that spiritual life for himself, he could then lose it for everybody else in the community. It's like if you imagine the church and per impossible, Christ ceased to be our Savior, mm -hmm all of the spiritual life would leave the church. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, if Adam is the center of the spiritual life of the early human community and he goes down, that's gonna take down the life of the early human community as well, spiritually speaking. Um, here's a really interesting one from Mick. Jimmy, I have a friend who not only holds the young earth creationism, but also geocentrism. Is that a valid view that Catholics can hold? Well, it's going to depend on what you mean by valid. If you mean, is it forbidden by Catholic teaching? No, it's not forbidden. Um, the, the, both young earth and geocentrism are matters of science, and therefore they are beyond the scope of church teaching. So the church doesn't have a teaching condemning young earth creationism or condemning geocentrism. So, um, He's not violating Catholic doctrine in holding those positions. He is putting himself at odds with the way the magisterium approaches these issues, which is to allow for an old earth and to allow for non-geocentric positions. Um, so, uh, so he's a bit at odds with the magisterium's approach, but he's not violating church teaching. Um, he's also, uh, you know, since this is a matter of science, these are matters of science, he's, um, he's on very dicey ground scientifically. We have really good evidence for an old universe, including an old Earth, and we have no way of establishing scientifically a center to the universe for the very simple reason we can't see its edge. If you can't see the edge of a space, you cannot identify the center of that space. So it's equally legitimate to say there is no center to the universe, or to say Earth is the center, or to say the Sun is the center, or to say Alpha Centauri is the center, or to say the Andromeda Galaxy is the center. Scientifically, we have no way of establishing a center, and therefore scientifically, there's you there's no way to um to establish one place as privileged over another just a few more wrapping it up here from sean matthew is science important in how we interpret the bible or must we interpret what the bible means without science first 
It's going to depend. Um, obviously, our all truth is God's truth, and we're meant to understand God's different sources of truth harmoniously. So, for example, um, let's take a scientific example. Um, let's say I'm trying to understand biology. Well, physics deals with certain matters that are also dealt with in biology, you know, like muscle strength and muscle tension and heart pumping blood. I mean, all those are physical processes that fluid dynamics, you know, that's, that's part of physics. Similarly, you have um, biological organisms are made out of atoms and physics got a lot to say about atoms. So, um, so I wouldn't say, oh, we should try to understand biology completely independently of physics and like partition physics and pretend it doesn't exist. Biology is part of God's truth. Physics is part of God's truth. We want to read them together. And in the same way, Scripture is part of God's truth, and it would be a mistake to isolate Scripture from other things we know as we try to interpret Scripture. Um, that includes not only scientific things, but other things as well, like matters of history. You know, we shouldn't say, oh, I need to understand the Bible completely irrespective of what I know from history. I need to forget all about Tiberius Caesar and Augustus Caesar and Claudius. I, those should just, I need to partition all of my knowledge of history and just look at what the Bible says and, and understand it that way first. Hmm. No, you already know. The, the biblical authors like Luke knew that people knew about Tiberius and Augustus and Claudius. He's expecting the audience to draw on their, on their secular historical knowledge when they're reading what he writes in his Gospel and Acts. He, so he's not expecting people to partition other things they, they know and look at text as if it's the only thing that exists. That's a kind of sola scriptura view which is not really compatible with the Catholic approach to things, which tends to be both and. If God's given us these different sources of knowledge, whether it's history or science or whatever else it may be, we should bring everything we know to bear when we're reading and seeking to understand Scripture. One quick follow-up to the uh, flood issue, just because it has bearing on how to interpret Genesis. Uh -huh. um, so the faith of the Church says context is important. Peter, Peter has in view a global event, final judgment, when he mm -hmm. brought up the flood. So does yep. that not assume kind of like a global flood? It, it may or may not. Um, people, one of the things people often, there's a huge amount of flexibility in terms of what people may mean by what they say. People often latch on to the first thing that occurs to them and they and they go with it and they tend not to think, well what else could this mean? Is this really is this implication really required? So I could imagine Peter thinking, now I don't have any reason to think Peter did think this, but I can imagine Peter, you know, saying, "Okay, well the 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 flood of Genesis, it was a local flood." But that doesn't mean he can't use it as a symbol and it as part of a contrastive metaphor for what's going to happen globally at the end time. He could take a local flood and use it as, you know, hey, guys, remember the last time the world got destroyed? Well, guess what? It's going to happen again, only it's going to be fire and it's going to be bigger. Hmm. You know, he could be pursuing a line of thought like that. On the other hand, he may be assuming it was a global flood. I would suspect that's probably the case. But again, assumptions are not assertions. Mm -hmm. And so we can't, we can't say that what the biblical authors assume is guaranteed to be true. Only, only, the, only the matters of faith and morals that they're asserting. This is why I always point to whenever people address difficulties in the magisterium and they say, well, look, you have to kind of reinterpret outside the church. There is no salvation uh, as it's presented in Florence for, compared to Vatican II to make sense of things. I always tell them 
you know, but you have greater difficulties in just making sense of sacred scripture itself. And mm -hmm. believe me, I, I hold to sacred scripture as divinely revealed and inerrant, but I'm just saying that there's greater tension there in interpreting some of those difficulties and resolving those difficulties compared to the magisterium. And I think that you, you just kind of pointed out to that whenever you have to address things like, well, the difference between what is asserted by the sacred author versus what is assumed by the sacred author. Mm -hmm. it, it might help just to um, give an illustration of something that's assumed mm -hmm. by a sacred author that turns out not to be the case. Let, let's hear it. Um, so Saint, it was a very common assumption mm -hmm. in the first generation, first few generations of Christians that Christ would return within their lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Peter, he's a first-generation Christian. Paul, he's a second-generation Christian. Mm -hmm. Timothy, he's a third-generation Christian. I mean, these are not biological generations, but they're in terms of orders of sequences of conversion. And it was assumed that, yeah, Jesus is going to be coming back any time now. In fact, Peter, on the, you know, on the day of the ascension, asked, are you going to do it right now? And so that's how fast Peter thought it might happen. Um, well, people thought Jesus is going to be coming back real soon. Eventually, God revealed that that was not the case, because by the time we get to the book of Revelation, God has revealed to John that there's going to be a thousand year or more period before the end of the world. So actually, Jesus is not about to come back, and we're not about to have the final end of all things. But Prior to a certain point, that hadn't yet been revealed. And so Paul, like many other early Christians, initially assumed that Christ would be coming back in his lifetime. And you can see him assuming that in um, in his first letters, which were First and Second Thessalonians. He wrote them about the year A.D. 50. Mm -hmm. And in First and Second Thessalonians, he's talking to the Thessalonians about the end of the world— They've been hearing some strange theories, which are very interesting. We don't really have time to go into them. But um, one of the things that he tells them is, look, guys, don't give up your hope for the Christian dead. They're going to be uh, assumed into the kingdom actually with us. Christ is going to come back. He's going to raise the dead. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up with him. So Paul is assuming he's going to be one of the people that is still alive at the time of the second coming. Well, Paul was wrong about that. In fact, Paul acknowledged he was wrong about that in um, about, the, about 17 years later. About A.D. 67, he's writing 2 Timothy, and in 2 Timothy, he says, I've run the race, it's all finished, the crown of righteousness is laid up for me, but I'm about to die. And so he knows at this point that, that Christ is not returning within his lifetime. So we can see how the assumption that Paul made initially, he didn't assert, I'm going to be alive, this is a teaching of the faith. Um, Christ revealed to me that I'm still going to be alive. He's not asserting it, but he is assuming it. And so that's an illustration of how an assumption that a biblical author has may not be true. It might be, but it also might not be. But we still have to make sense of that scripture. So is the way that we make sense of it that we who is alive refers to we collectively as Christians? Yes. The, the, the principle that Paul is articulating is true. Mm -hmm. What he is asserting, and, and that is guaranteed to be true, is that at the second coming, mm -hmm. both dead and living Christians will be raised and caught up to be with Christ. Mm -hmm. And do you think that maybe he's referring to the coming... Um, in his destruction of the temple, because some people kind of associated the destruction of the temple with uh, the coming of Christ. So could, could it have been that he was hinting at that and not the great final judgment? I, based on my reading of, and I, I wrote a commentary on first and Thess it's not published, but I, yet, but I wrote a commentary a few years ago on first and second Thessalonians. And my read is that he's, he is talking about the genuine second coming at the end of the world. Mm -hmm. But the matter is complicated because there are, there's more than one coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, when the Bible talks about God coming, Mm -hmm. Frequently, it means it coming in judgment, not a 
not a visible manifestation. And so there, I think we can talk about, and I often do talk about, Christ coming in judgment on the Jerusalem temple. I think that what I think that in the again like just like there was an assumption on many people's part that that the second coming was going to happen in their lifetime there was also an assumption on many people's part that the second coming would occur at the time of the coming in judgment on the temple hmm. and eventually it was revealed that was not the case hmm. so you have more than one coming of Christ but I think the assumption that the two would coincide is probably part of the background to why Matthew 25, which contains material about the end of the world, is directly appended to Matthew 24. And we know from Mark and the parallels in Mark and Luke that the material in Matthew 24, that's about the temple. And but because the coming of Christ against the temple and the coming the second coming were assumed to be the same thing in the early church, by at least some people in the early church, Matthew appends end of the world material to his discussion of the destruction of the temple. Last question for you from Emmanuel. To my understanding, the mm -hmm. scientific method requires that a theory be testable. Mm -hmm. Is evolution something that is testable by science, or is it accepted by some as a matter of faith? Well, it's certainly accepted by non-scientists who haven't studied the evidence as a matter of faith, but there is there is testable scientific evidence. But to give you an example, um, so um, all through history, people have known that children resemble their parents. You know, and that's not just true of us; it's true of other off of other species too. If you, you know, breed a, a dog, it, it's going to look like its parents. If you breed a horse, it's going to look like its parents. So people have always known this. And in the nineteenth um, century, the Augustinian abbot Gregor Mendel worked out the fundamental laws of inheritance. And then in the twentieth century, um, well it was then realized that the information that determines the characteristics an organism has is housed in what are called genes. And in the mid 20th century, uh, scientists like Watson and Crick figured out that, okay, it's it, these genes, they're made of DNA, which is structured as a double helix. And, and today we've mapped the genomes of species. And one of the things we found is that the genes for blue-eyedness in humans having blue eyes now mine are green uh yours look brown brown yeah brown yeah, <laughs> yeah. um but the genes for blue-eyedness are recessive and what that means is if one of your parents has blue eyes and one of your parents has brown eyes and you get a brown eyed gene as a result of that then you're going to have brown eyes even though you're already carrying genes for blue eyes and so what you can infer if you would do a genetic test on someone and let's say he's let's say I do a genetic test on Michael Lofton and he's got brown eyes and I look in his genome and I see okay he's got brown eye genes but he's also got blue eyed genes mm -hmm. that means Michael Lofton had some blue eyed ancestors mm -hmm. and fairly recently or they would have been weeded out mm -hmm. okay so by looking at Michael Lofton's genes I can see he's got blue eyed ancestors now Let's talk about humans more generally. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that every life form has is, at least every animal life form, but really every life form has, is how is it going to get nutrients to its offspring when the offspring are still developing? Humans do that by means of placentas. So a placenta is, an, is a temporary organ that humans have. They grow early in their development. It attaches to the mother's womb, and it extracts nutrients from the mother's bloodstream, you know, oxygen and, and glucose and things like that that it uses to build its body. Okay, so that's how we do it. And then when we get born, just like a tadpole's tail falls off, our placentas fall off. Hmm. Um, so that's how we do it, but that's not how a lot of life forms do it. It is how all mammals do it. All mammals have placentas, or at least placental mammals do. Um, but then there are also life forms that don't have placentas at all. They lay eggs. 
And so, you know, that includes birds and fish and reptiles, lots of things that aren't even a few, even a few mammals, the non-placental mammals, but um, uh, lots of things lay eggs. And there's no way that an egg can have a placenta that's still attached to its mother. So they have to have another solution for how to get nutrients to the developing offspring. And the way they use is a yolk. That's what the yolk in an egg is. It's the reservoir of nutrients that the developing life form is going to draw on since it's not attached to its mother. Okay, so yolks are made from proteins. Uh, the kind of general name for these is vitelligenin. And like any other thing a life form does as part of its natural functioning, yolks are grown by genes that control the production of vitelligenin. And these are known as VIT genes or VIT genes. Well, it so happens that not only are VIT genes found in birds and reptiles and fish, they're also found in mammals. They're found in human beings. They're found in Jimmy Aiken and Michael Lofton and everybody who's listening to us. We all have VIT genes that are designed to produce egg yolks. And from that, just like we could infer from Michael Lofton having blue-eyed genes that one of his ancestors was blue-eyed, we can infer from the fact we all have VIT genes that we had ancestors who laid eggs. And this is, and they didn't have placentas. Mammals hadn't yet developed. So this is just one point among many scientifically. We also have genes to do other things like grow scales and live underwater. They're not manifested in us because we don't use them. Our evolution has taken a different path, but we have multiple points of science that um, that are supportive of this idea. And this is why evolution tends to pass the falsifiability test scientifically. Because if we do have um, ancestors who laid eggs, it would be a reasonable expectation to find genes for making eggs in our genome. And we do. Whereas, if someone proposed, I bet we have egg-laying ancestors, but then there's no trace of egg-laying genes in our genome, that would tend to falsify the hypothesis that we had egg-laying ancestors. So evolution is falsifiable, but it has repeatedly failed to be falsified. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jimmy, for coming on and doing this. Any closing thoughts that you wanted to add or certainly put in a plug for anything you're working on and, of course, for your channel? Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, I would just, on a general term, you know, um, in Essentials Unity, in, uh, in other things, diversity, but in all things charity, um, this situation, this whole question of origins is unnecessarily complicated by a lot of hostility coming from both sides. Mm -hmm. And I try to be one of the voices in the wilderness that's a peacemaker and that's trying to show respect for both camps. I mean, I have my own views on some of these. A lot of what I've done, I haven't even talked about my own views. I've just said, here's what the magisterium has said. Um, so I'm just trying to, I'm trying to represent the magisterium. I'm trying to, if people ask questions like, is this falsifiable? What evidence is there? Well, I'm happy to share some of the ev evidence that evolutionists would point to. But I think this is an area where we need to tone down mm. the hostility and tone up the love and charity because you can be a good Christian and a good Catholic, no matter what your beliefs on this subject are, whether you're a young earth creationist or an old earth evolutionist, both of us can be good Christians and Christians in good conscience, and we should respect each other. In terms of things to plug, um, you know, I work at Catholic Answers. Uh, people can go, and I regularly am on Catholic Answers Live. People can call in and ask me questions. You can go to Catholic Answers' YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash catholiccom. No period in it because of 
there aren't periods in those names. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also uh, check out my Mysterious World podcast. We're actually, every Friday, we look at a mysterious subject. We look at them from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. And we're in the top 20 documentary podcasts on Apple Podcasts mm -hmm. in the U.S. This week, we were number 16. When we released our first Rudolph Hess episode, it peaked at number six. Wow. So um, we've got more than 100,000 listeners. Would love to have people along for the ride. I never expect people to agree with me, mm -hmm. but I try to lay out interesting things for people to think about. And you can also go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, or my personal website, jimmyaiken.com. But while you're at youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, I am trying to grow my channel. We're, we're getting close to... Uh, closer to 40,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. So I'd really appreciate it if you uh, subscribe and hit the bell notification, whether so that you always get a notification, whether it's for a Mysterious World video or one of the apologetic videos I do. Excellent. I appreciate your work so much. Thank you for coming on and doing this and answering the questions. Truly, truly appreciate you. My pleasure. And likewise. And let me put in a quick plug here. My book, free ebook, just came out, Church Chaos. Go to reasonandtheology.com. You'll see a pop-up that will take you to it where you can download it for free. Biblical insights for confused Catholics. So if you are confused about the crisis in the church today, this is a book you want to read. Again, it is free as an ebook. Reason and Theology. Once again, thank you so much for coming on. And everybody, hit the like button and the subscribe button. And also check me out on patreon.com forward slash.